out. Um, today's discussion is in chapter six. And I'll tell you, it's a little bit odd. We've been building up, talking about Jesus and all he's doing in his ministry. And I'll tell you, it's exciting to talk about that. It's a story we love to tell. But Mark slams on the brakes and tells us the end of the story of John the Baptist. Frankly, it's a depressing story. We were talking about um, Mark chapter 6, where Jesus went to his own hometown. And there was this line in the scripture. Here it is. It was, it was in uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 5. He could not do any miracles there. Is that my Greek? Yeah, that's my NIV. Okay. He could not do any miracles because the people didn't believe, and he was shocked at their unbelief. Yeah, I no faith. They, that's right. He was shocked at their lack of faith. And if you recall, I gave you a challenge. Did anybody do their homework? I said, does faith all, I mean, sorry, does, does healing in the scripture always come with the person coming to Jesus for healing, showing faith? Is there always that faith connection in healing? And it turns out the answer is no, it is not always. And in fact, I'm surprised how easy it was to find. I'll tell you, remember two stories. There's a story in Luke chapter 7 about the widow whose son has died. And she is in at, at, at the point where the story is. She's in a funeral procession out. They're leaving the town to bury her son. And Jesus happens just to walk on to the stage there. And without being asked anything, by anybody. Scripture says he had compassion on her and went over and touched the body and the kid sits up. He was dead for a while. Yes, he was dead. He was on his way to now in Jewish culture they, they don't they don't let the bury uh, they don't let the burial take a long time. So it's it's not one of those three day situations. Normally you bury, in a, think about it, they're in a hot climate. You, you've got to bury a body quickly. There's no embalming. There's no embalming. So you, it, it's, it's, it's the same day or it's the next day at the most. But it's, it's not, it's not one of those three days. Remember last he stinketh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Lazarus was probably closer to four. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, let me give you one more. Um, remember the story. Now, this is not a Jesus healing. This is a Peter healing. Remember in the story of uh, Peter uh, at the beginning of the book of Acts. I, I didn't actually note down this, but it's, it's the healing of the beggar at the temple. He and I think it was James or John. 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 You're good. Okay. Is walking to the temple. They're going. They're going to worship. And the beggar is asking for money, not for healing. He's asking for money. And and Peter says, "Oh, well, I'm sorry, I don't have any money. No silver or gold. But I'll give you what I have." And and he, I don't remember if he touches or whatever, but he. He heals. And, and that was with no, that person did not ask for healing. Uh, so, so it turns out there were two examples that were, are pretty easy to find where, yes, healing does come 
without an act of faith involved. And that got me thinking, and I shared some thoughts with Tim early in the week. The problem is, what do I learn about healing here? What, well, what's, the, what's the message? What's the, what's the Christian message? And it occurred to me that I may have pushed things too far. Having faith does not guarantee you healing. Underline the word guarantee. A lot of good, faithful Christians are suffering right now with a disease or dying right now in a hospice situation in the hospital. Now, on the other hand, what did we just do five, 10 minutes ago? We prayed for healing. So what is our teaching on healing? Now, let me throw in another problem. There is a, uh, there are people all over the world engaged in healing who are not Christians. They are secular or they are of other faiths. They may be doctors, physicians in all kinds of cultures all over the world. And it turns out a lot of times they are successful. They, 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 they administer some medicine or they perform some surgery and the patient gets better. So from our own experience, we know some faithful people still suffer and are not healed. And some unfaithful people are healed. So what do we learn about faith and heal. That's my have, question. You always have to have faith. That's what you're saying. You don't have to have faith. God will heal you anyway. If you, Jesus came as a suffering servant. He said, what do you want me to do for you? He always said that. He believed. What do you want me to do? And he would do it. Yeah, but that's, yeah. What, but that's what I'm saying, Jim. Does he always do it? If, if, if a faithful Christian says, Lord, please heal me, do you receive healing? Or maybe to put it a little in a little sharper focus, could it be said that the Christian who prays for himself and has an army of people praying for him for maybe cancer, let's say, does he have any statistically better chance? <laughs> of being healed than the unbeliever. I wish I'd known that you were... The very guys praying for it, I would do something God would do. Well, All these people are praying for you, I'm going to heal you. But Tim asked a, a tricky question. He said, is there a statistical advantage? And the reason he asked that is because I, I, I think there have been studies. I just can't quote them. I didn't, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. It, it, I do believe that there are studies which document the effectiveness of intercessory prayer. I can't cite them. I don't, I don't have it memorized. Is that what you were thinking about? I wouldn't be surprised if it were statistically significant. Are you okay? I didn't know which way you were going. No, they are statistically significant. Uh, yeah, and I don't know about those studies. Um, I think we have to be very careful here because we are we are not claiming that our faith makes life easier for us. The Bible is full of people whose faith made life far more difficult for them. Yeah. yeah. Remember, all the apostles die except John. I'm sorry, are martyred Martyr. except for John. Yeah. John lives a long life. Let me go back to Peter. Peter was in prison. They all put him to death. Everybody that knew Peter, he was the head of the church for a while, 
They prayed for him. Everybody prayed for him and knew him. And an angel came and, and the wall came up. He was in pre thought he was dreaming. All the chains, everything, mm -hmm. the box opened up, the door opened up, the people, the guards were sleeping. Now, let's, let's just take that for a minute. It was that for uh, Peter, uh, it also happened to Paul, right? He was yeah. in prison and yeah. the chains fell off. Yeah. And after that story of Paul, the the real beneficiary in that story was the jailer who came to believe. Came to believe, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, him and himself. Yeah. So the important thing there, this, why is that story in the Bible? It's as a testimony to the power of God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So uh, he, healing, we, we, are, we focus on healing, I think. Because it hurts, because these things threaten us physically. If you have a toothache, uh, I know I can think of nothing else but my tooth. Yeah. That's a, I want to get it taken care of. That's priority number one. But there are many more problems, you know, in my life and in other people's lives than health issues. And those are also important. Remember, it's just that healing hurts. To, today yeah. in, in, in our worship service, we read the account by Paul that he had a thorn in the flesh. That was his eyes. Well, we, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what exactly it was. The point he was making there was I prayed for healing three times. And God told me my grace is sufficient. And that got me thinking that we can say without a doubt that one healing that does come from faith, it always comes, is the healing that God offers us in salvation. Our biggest problem is that we are separated from God. Sin separates us from God. And God says to us, I can wipe that away. So when he says to Paul, my grace is sufficient, that's what he's reminding Paul. Paul, you're a forgiven sinner. That's enough. Paul says, yeah, but I'd like my eye to stop aching. But no, my grace is sufficient is some is sometimes the answer. And and I and we I think if Paul could not explain it. I don't think I can explain it. I think we are called to ask God for what we need. And if I need healing in my life because of illness, because of a relationship, because of some addiction, then I should ask for it. God wants me to ask for it. But we don't have a magic bullet. Our and life. Maybe that story about Paul is there to show us that. Yeah. Deliberately. We can't just wave our cross and say, well, you're, you know, you are healed. And so your cancer is gone or whatever. No, I'm afraid it's not, it doesn't work that way. Even a solid Christian is fell three times. I think, I think the devil wants you to have pain and God is against the devil. He wants to relieve you. Yes, and say, but, but again, that what you would the think that the answer is. I know. You well, heal pain. God says, no, I want to heal Tim, and he will. Yeah. Okay. Let's... Uh, Before you leave that, okay, go ahead. the issue, I thought uh, a little more about the issue there in Nazareth, uh, which struck Doug and me so strangely. He could not do miracles. Not that he wouldn't do them. He said he could. He was somehow he not blocked. Do. What is it that blocked Jesus' ability to do miracles? He did a few, okay, but he was suppressed by something. And I believe that that something is the active rejection of who he was by his townspeople. Other people, there's a difference between unbelief and non-belief. 
on, um, it's possible to absolutely flat out reject Jesus. I'll give you an example. We have a member in the Breakfast Fellowship who sleeps outdoors all the time. He's the only one I know of that always, as a matter of fact, he is so anti-social that he will not come inside anymore. He, he did, and talk and be cordial, but he doesn't come in anymore. I asked him this morning, what is your opinion of Jesus? And he said, Tim, I think he was probably a very nice man, but all those things that were said about him doing miracles were lies. He didn't do those things as he did. And he was murdered. That's, that's what I believe about Jesus. See, that's, that's actively rejecting Christ. And by the way, remember, just point. Yeah. C.S. Lewis told us that, that the argument he just made is ridiculous. It's you cannot say he was a pretty nice man because and, and not God, because Jesus told us repeatedly that he was God. Do nice people lie? Remember what he said? He said, uh, um, if you believe in God, believe also in me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Then what he wanted. But you're you're a believer, Jim. That's why you can say those. So let, let me. I, I need to move on. I'm sorry, but I didn't realize I would take so long on this. My answer is that faith. We do pray for healing. We have faith that God heals. But it isn't a magical formula that produces it. If if you know if I say the right words, um, that my my father will be healed from some cancer. It's not that it's, it just doesn't work that way. God wants us to rely on him. He wants us to have faith. And when we push him, he reminds us, I've, I've given you the greatest gift I can give. You already have salvation through my son's death. Yeah. And anything else, uh, I mean, Anyway, let me move on to the story of John the Baptist. Now, this is, this is interesting because the story about Jesus is exploding. At the end of last week's class, remember, he, he sent out his group. He was going village to village, and then he really hit the accelerator because he sends his men out two by two, well, how is your service? Hi, Pat. I can hear. She's muted now. She's muted. Okay. Pat muted her, so we didn't hear their conversation. Okay. Uh, the point is, Jesus sends his his disciples out. The message is getting out. His men are being successful. Remember, we talked about that. They, they, they had authority over evil spirits. They, they went out and healed, anointed many sick people, and healed them. Now, this is where the story, I just kind of wish G, uh, Mark hadn't taken this little side road. He says, the stories were getting around so much that even the king heard the stories. That's my connection for this. King Herod hears about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Everybody in the community was talking about Jesus, even all the way up to the king in the castle. I think that's an interesting way to see it. But you then Mark remembers, oh yes, but there's a problem with the king remembering the story. Because the king is not innocent. The king had killed John the Baptist. Well, why did he kill John the Baptist? Well, I have to tell you the story about how he killed John the Baptist. 
So poor, poor Herod, sitting on his throne, thinks he's being persecuted by the ghost of John the Baptist. And since he's got a guilty mind, it, it, you know, it can make sense. Anyway, let's keep going. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And though that's why uh, he's doing these miracles. Now, just, just quickly, remember, John the Baptist did not perform miracles during his lifetime. There aren't any miracle stories associated with John the Baptist. So the logic that must be in this sentence is that now that he's been raised from the dead, he has some supernatural power that he, he didn't have while he was on earth the first time. Okay. That, that must be the weird logic that's going on here. Okay. Well, it turns out other people were talking about this guy who is Jesus. One of the, one of the questions was, was, he is Elijah. Scripture had foretold. I just realized I'm I'm using this document, but your, Tim, your questions are in another document. Hold on. Oh dear. It's okay. Jesus did say a, a forerunner of, of himself, of John the Baptist, but he also um, I, don't, I don't know how I forget how to say that. They didn't know Jesus was God. Nobody knew Jesus was God. They thought he was a great prophet. That's right. And that's why the Son, God in the flesh. That's why these people are talking about it now. Some people say he's Elijah. The Old Testament prophesied that that the coming of the Messiah would be um, foretold by the re the return of Elijah. And then some other people don't know which prophet. They say he's just some other prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. And the whole Old Testament is full of names of Old Testament prophets. But now back to Herod, verse 16. But when Herod heard all this, he said, John, the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. Now, okay. So John was beheaded. Why? Beheaded. And that gets us to this story. This is a story of just ultimate sin. Um, John was in because of what he had said to Herod and Herodias, his, his quote, wife about their relationship. Herodias is already married when she meets Herod. And Herod has another, and I'll put it in quotes because I don't know the exact legal status. He's already involved with the, the daughter of another king who's country out east. So both of these people already have relationships. I don't know if they were legally married or not. <clears throat> doesn't matter. They were, they had relationships. I think it does refer to uh, he had his brother's wife. Oh, well, Herodias yeah. was married to whoever she was married to. Yeah. Yeah. His brother. His brother, which I think that means Herod's brother. It's weird. Okay, now, and without knowing the details, we'll, we will trust that John was correct. In Jewish law, he says, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. The scripture doesn't argue with that sentence. So we'll assume that John has the Moses law correct. He, John, um, Herod is in a situation that is adulterous. And nobody argues against it. Okay? Herod even doesn't argue. He, Herod doesn't say, you're wrong. 
He just says, how dare you accuse the king? Yeah. Anyway. I'm very he used guilty. to talk to John and Chris. He would talk, he got to hear what John had to say. Because John was a forerunner of Christ. And, and probably John about to say, you know, that was Jesus that hung on that cross. Well. Something like that. Herodias is upset. And Herod doesn't let John off the hook completely. He has him arrested. And there's this, and I think in the movies that I've watched about this, they, they, they make a big deal of this last line of that paragraph. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. So, so the idea is he puts John in prison so he can kind of have late night conversations with this guy with the strange hair and camel hair coat. Anyway, um, Herod seems to be intrigued. Herodias is just angry. She wants she wants him dead. Herod says, "No, no, no, no. He's a holy man. We can't we can't we can't kill a holy man." So time passes, and then we get this story. This is the birthday party. Uh, Herod's having a birthday party. Lots of famous, powerful people have been invited to his party. And they had a celebration going. Now, probably there were more dancers. It doesn't really matter. The, the point is, and you can just let, let your mind wander a little bit. This, this is lewd conduct. This is immoral conduct. Okay. Women dancing in front of men. Obvious purpose for all that. And also, Salome is... Herod, <clears throat> excuse me, Herod Philip's daughter. So yes. it's uh, on yeah, Herodias's the, side. <laughs> it's his brother's daughter. Yes, th th that's where I, 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 that's why I was pointing out the lewdness of this. The lewdness now gets ramped up a complete new level because it's the princess that comes in the room. One thing, you know, to hire prostitutes or whoever they used to hire, I don't know how they get the dancing girls, but you get the dancing girls into your party. But you ask your brother's daughter or, or your, your um, sorry, um, it's actually his stepdaughter. You ask your stepdaughter to strip down and, and dance for the men in the party? That's horrible. It wasn't bad enough. In other words, it's gotten worse. Now, Herodias does a good job. She, she plays her part. She dances well. And then Herod says to her, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. Whatever you want, up to half of my kingdom I will give you. Now she's got it. Now, Think about Salome. She, she, who knows? She may have known how much her mother hated John, but just imagine this. What if she didn't know how bad she hated John? So she's just been promised by the king. You can have anything you want. So Salome goes, runs to her mother. Mom, I can have anything I want. You know, she's picturing a boat. Yeah. <laughs> she's picturing she's a picturing a fancy car, big house, you know. She's she said, you know, she's thinking, I got it made. I've won the lottery. What she says, what shall I ask for? Oops. Her mom says, the head of John the Baptist. Now, honestly by looking at the next sentence, it does seem like the girl probably knew where this was going all from the very beginning because she doesn't argue. 
she says, you know, she doesn't say to her mom, oh, does that mean I don't get the car? <laughs> you know, well, in fact, it's, it's, a, it's so deep from the beginning because the word Arid in Jewish terms means hero. Now, this is not how a hero acts. And well, the other part is that under Jewish law, remember, the Romans ran the whole country of Israel. It was a Roman Empire. And Herod Antipas was a Roman tetrarch, so he would be compared to just a governor of a land. He's a king to the Jews, but in Roman terms, he's only a governor. So he doesn't have a kingdom to give away. Yeah, there's more, to this, yep, there, there's more to this Herod story, Bill. Um, first of all, this is the son of the Herod. Go back to the beginning of the uh, incarnation, the Christmas story. There's a Herod in that story. Remember the one that kills the two-year-old children? That's Herod the Great, correct. Right. Uh, I, 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 the, none of these guys are great. They are, they are not very good characters. But you mentioned the king and the tetrarch role. It is true that Herod was so bad. You have to be pretty bad to, to get Rome to treat you like Herod. Herod was such a bad tetrarch that they denied, Rome denied him the use of the name king. I don't know what he called himself officially. But the Jews did call him King Herod. That's why in the Bible it calls him King Herod. There but more than one Herod. There was other Herod. There are other brothers. I, I don't know. But let's let's move on here. Um, he does give in. He, he the girl goes to the king and says, "Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter." Now, the king was greatly distressed. Oh, poor Herod. But you know what? The word distressed there, this is, this is real pain. It's the same word that's used to describe Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's so... It's not just he's embarrassed or some other word like that. He he realizes now he's gotten himself in a box that he didn't want to be in. I'm not trying to say good things about Herod, but he did he did like John enough to listen to him. Yeah. And he didn't plan ahead and got himself into this situation. But you know, he's gonna be the same Herod at the end of the story. We're only in chapter six here. When we get to the end of this book, we get to the crucifixion. Remember, King Herod comes back into the story and is involved in the trials of Jesus. So he's going to end up participating in the crucifixion through that, through those trials. Right. The only thing that's true about King Herod is his word, because at that time, Ost when you give an oath to somebody, half his kingdom, he did that in public, that's considered sacred and unbreakable. He can't yep. change his mind after he says it. Yep, it's, it's a weird one. Now, just so you know, by the way, uh, I, don't, I don't have all the historical uh, citations to give you here, but things do not end up well for Herod. Herod and Herodias get through this. I mean, they, they, they kill John the Baptist. And a couple years later, they're going to be involved in the death of Jesus. But then things unravel. And at some point, they are exiled by Rome. They actually exiled them to France, which was called Gaul at the time. And both of them end their lives in suicide. I don't know why. I don't know what triggered the suicides. But they, they, they do win this battle, but they lose shortly. Only a few more years down the road, they end up in exile and they kill, they kill themselves uh, suicide. That's when the devil rewards people who help. 
Well, I, I, yeah, it, it, not much good to say about poor, poor hair. So, no, it, so, so Tim's question was, why did the king consent? Um, Bill, you, you said it. The, the problem was the oath that, that Harry had made. He, if he, maybe if he had seen all the moving parts to this story, he would have changed the language of his, his oath, but he was in a corner that he couldn't get out of. Yeah, as I said, he probably thought she just wanted a new car. Anyway. Well, that gets me to the end of this little aside, side journey into John the Baptist. Any other questions or comments? Jesus said, anybody believes and believes in my name, I will go wise cast out. Now, the only person believes in Jesus believes in the name. They're, they're still Jesus saved them. Okay. I, and you, I don't know why you brought that up. I was going to say it before Oh, oh, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. We're going to close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, turn the share off. There's Pat again. Here's the room, Pat. There's Tim, Hi, Linda. Hi. There's Jim. Over there is Jeff. Hi, Pat. That's no, oh, and I'm over here. See, hi. Oh, <laughs> Any thoughts? Everybody have a safe fourth and enjoy it. Yeah, have a nice holiday. Take take a little time off. The guy across the street from where I live in church in hours, he said at one thirty he did something that sets off each fire. He had like a fire, something has stuff coming out. Not a fire, and stuff coming out. Uh, people want to sleep. One very morning, they wake up and look out the window and see fire. Uh, uh, yeah, that doesn't sound too neighborly to me. Well, yeah, it's just not nice at 1 30 in the morning. Well, everybody have a good week. I'm going to end the meeting. See you, Bill. Bye-bye now.